picture this if you will. You're a doctor in the intensive care unit when you get a call from the hospitalist. An 85-year-old male admitted for a urinary tract infection has taken a turn for the worse. He's become increasingly confused with fever spiking to 39.5 Celsius. His blood pressure, despite adequate administration of fluids, is 70 over 45, and you suspect that his urinary tract infection is causing him to go into septic shock. You speak to his daughter who's at the bedside about the need to start a norepinephrine drip to improve his blood pressure. In the process of informed decision-making, you inform her that one of the risks of starting vasopressors is the potential to cause ischemia and necrosis to the fingers, toes, and bowel. Somewhat alarmed, she asks you why you would give him a medication that can cause ischemia when his blood pressure is already too low to begin with. Thinking back to physiology, you consider your answer carefully. Welcome to another section on cardiovascular physiology, this time on local autoregulation. While the relationship may not be obvious, this section derives heavily from your understanding of resistance, pressure, and flow, basic principles of fluid dynamics that you should understand thoroughly before going over this section. By the end of this episode, you'll be able to 1. List the organs most capable of increasing vasodilation based on their metabolic need, identify important molecular mediators of vasodilation, and explain the physiology of how these increase local blood flow. 2. Identify the most important molecular mediator of pulmonary vascular autoregulation and explain its role in optimizing pulmonary function. 3. Describe the stimulus and vascular response in the renal myogenic and tuboglomerular feedback. And 4. Identify the most important mediator of cutaneous vascular autoregulation and explain the purpose of this response. We often simplify our view of the cardiovascular system by depicting it as a simple circuit diagram with all the arterioles and all the vascular beds combined and represented by a total peripheral resistance. By Ohm's law, the total peripheral resistance helps determine the rate of blood flow out of the heart or the cardiac output. And this allows people to make broad generalizations about the cardiac output based on the total peripheral resistance. For example, vasoactive substances like norepinephrine and angiotensin that increase the total peripheral resistance in an attempt to increase the blood pressure will correspondingly decrease the cardiac output. But what this bird's eye view doesn't capture is how different vascular beds respond differently to the signals of vasoactive substances. The heart and brain, for example, are extremely metabolically active organs. Not only that, it's also crucial that their metabolic demand be met at all times, as even a temporary loss of perfusion to these organs can make bad things happen. So, even if the majority of the body's vasculature is under the influences of systemic vasoconstrictors, the heart and brain are able to override systemic signaling if their perfusion needs aren't being met, and correspondingly, vasodilate their capillary beds in times of metabolic need. The end result is that blood, taking the path of least resistance, routes preferentially into the capillary beds of the heart and brain to maintain the high rates of blood flow required by these organs, even though, as we said before, the overall cardiac output is in fact decreased. The skeletal muscle also knows this trick to some extent. It's not a vital organ, but during strenuous activity, it requires a humongous blood supply, up to a whopping 80% of the cardiac output. So it's also able to increase its blood supply based on metabolic need. But since it's not a vital organ, it's only able to do this during exercise. At rest, the body's actually pretty aggressive about limiting its blood supply in the form of high sympathetic vascular tone, since, if left unchecked, the skeletal muscle could potentially divert way too much blood away from the rest of the body. Now, the paracrine signaling that goes into this need-based vasodilation is only partially understood, but here's what we do know. The heart's arterioles allow more blood when they detect hypoxia and hypercarbia, a sign that the heart's rate of aerobic metabolism is starting to exceed its supply of oxygen and rate of CO2 removal. The brain and skeletal muscle do something similar, but in general respond a lot more to hypercarbia than they do hypoxia. The skeletal muscle also increases its blood flow when the arterioles sense local acidosis or elevated lactate, which reflect the fact that it's far more likely to require additional blood supply for anaerobic metabolism than either the heart or the brain. You know, for when you're powerlifting, as opposed to when you're running a marathon. Both cardiac and skeletal muscle respond to molecules released as a result of muscle contraction, but the skeletal muscle is more responsive to potassium than the heart is. Adenosine's effects as a cardiac vasodilator, much like nitric oxide, have important clinical applications as well as physiologic ones. Finally, while first aid doesn't cover it in this section, it is worth mentioning that the brain is actually the most finicky organ in the body when it comes to autoregulation. Not only does its metabolic demand mean that it doesn't tolerate hypoperfusion, it actually doesn't tolerate hyperperfusion either. Being tightly wrapped in a bony cage, the brain has no room to expand if it ever goes under pressure. Now, this is a big and fairly complicated topic, which you should read the neuro section on, but know that autoregulation of cerebral blood flow involves very tight pressure control 
so that random spikes in blood pressure don't cause you to herniate and die. When compared to the previous three organs, pulmonary autoregulation seems downright counterintuitive. Unlike the other three, who compensate for local hypoxia by increasing the blood supply, the lungs do the exact opposite. Local hypoxia actually causes vasoconstriction. And you might be thinking to yourself, what, do the alveoli hate oxygen or something? And then you realize, you're still thinking in the paradigm of the heart, brain, and skeletal muscles. I mean, those three selfish brats are always complaining, wah, I need more oxygen, wah, I'm gonna have a seizure and go into cardiac arrest. With the lungs, it's all part of a strategy to minimize VQ mismatch. Because whether due to positional differences in blood flow, or just a big old pneumonia, the lungs routinely have to deal with the problem of blood flowing to parts of the lungs where they aren't going to get any meaningful gas exchange. Then, when the oxygenated blood mixes with the deoxygenated blood, what's sent out to the rest of the body ends up being pretty poorly oxygenated. But if the pulmonary arterioles clamp down in the regions that sense local hypoxia and stay open wherever the lungs well oxygenated, blood will again follow the path of least resistance and be rerouted to well oxygenated parts of the lung which ends up greatly improving the blood oxygenation. Thanks for taking one for the team, lungs. The arterioles of the kidneys are a way bigger can of worms than I have time to get into right now, especially since there's two of them in series. But since this section is about autoregulation of blood flow to each organ, we're going to pretend that this second resistor here doesn't exist for the time being. You can learn all about it in the section on filtration in renal physiology, which, coincidentally, I also teach. Renal autoregulation, much like pulmonary autoregulation, is all about optimizing flow to the organ so that blood can be processed properly under a wide range of conditions. In the case of the kidney, it has to maintain even perfusion under a wide range of blood pressures, because no matter whether you're dehydrated or having a hypertensive crisis, your kidneys must do their job consistently to maintain your blood chemistry within a narrow margin of acceptable homeostasis. Now, there's two mechanisms for this. The first one is called the myogenic reflex, and it's pretty intuitive. If the afferent arteriole is hit with a spike in blood pressure, it reflectively constricts, making sure that the pressure in the capillary bed doesn't also spike and increase filtration inappropriately. As it turns out, all arterioles do this to one extent or another. The second one is a little bit more involved. Tubuloglomerular feedback is where the afferent arteriole vasodilates when it senses decreased renal tubular flow. Physiologically, this usually happens during states of hypotension or hypovolemia, where blood flow to the kidney decreases along with flow to the rest of the body, which would ordinarily decrease the amount of filtration into the renal tubular system as well. Now, the nephron is shaped in such a way that after it gets done with all its fun loop-de-loop -loop action, it actually circles back and plants itself right in the crotch of those two renal arterioles. That crotchal region of the distal tubule is surrounded by these busy body cells collectively known as the macula densa, whose sole purpose it is to monitor for drops in renal tubular flow by the sodium concentration. When it senses a drop in renal tubular flow, it immediately complains to the afferent arteriole using prostaglandins and nitric oxide, causing the afferent arteriole to dilate and increase blood flow to the glomerulus. Finally, cutaneous autoregulation exists primarily for the purpose of thermoregulation. Because we're human beings and not, you know, lizards, we generate a lot of heat, and are in general significantly warmer than our surrounding environment. We're also constantly losing the heat we generate through our skin in the form of infrared radiation and the evaporation of sweat. As endotherms, we're personally responsible for balancing the heat we generate with the heat we lose so that we stay at a nice toasty 36 to 38 Celsius. From the endocrine side, we can regulate our heat production, but in the short term, the most important thing we can do is to increase or decrease our cutaneous heat loss. When our bodies get cold, Local sympathetic signaling causes vasoconstriction. Blood gets routed internally rather than on the surface of the skin where it'll lose heat to the external environment, and in doing so, keeps the heat we generate within us. And that covers the basics of autoregulation in the special capillary beds. One final word of wisdom. Autoregulation isn't just localized to the capillary beds we went over today. Virtually every single capillary bed has the ability to autoregulate based on need and myogenic feedback to some extent or another. But autoregulation in the capillary beds we went over today is a much more potent determinant of blood flow than in most. And now, my friends, I think it's time to review what you know with a flash quiz. Thinking back to our case from the introduction, you consider how to answer this question. How does the administration of norepinephrine, a systemic vasopressor, to a hypotensive patient result in increased blood flow to vital organs, but decreased blood flow to the extremities and bowel? This is kind of an involved question, so pause the video and think about this for a moment before moving on. So the way vasopressors cause ischemia isn't hard to understand. 
vasoconstriction by increasing the vascular resistance decreases the cardiac output and decreases blood flow to most organs. But the heart and brain are able to counteract the effect of systemic vasoconstrictors when their metabolic demands aren't being met. So while the total peripheral resistance is increased, blood flow to the heart and brain is maintained. And because the blood pressure increases, the brain and heart will actually experience increased blood flow because of the increased resistance in vascular beds in the rest of the body. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. There's a lot of different mechanisms of autoregulation out there, but here's the bottom line. The heart and brain are capable of increasing their blood flow through local vasodilation when the arterioles sense that the tissue blood supply is less than the metabolic demand. The skeletal muscle does the same, but only during exercise. Pulmonary arterioles correct VQ mismatch by vasoconstricting and routing blood away from poorly oxygenated sections of the lung. The kidney maintains steady perfusion and filtration by afferent vasoconstriction in response to high blood pressures, myogenic feedback, and vasodilating in response to low tubular flow, tubular glomerular feedback. Cutaneous arterioles maintain temperature by vasoconstricting in the cold, preventing the heat exchange between blood and the external environment. If you like this video, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button down below. And as always, comments are more than welcome. Arjun Iyer, signing out.